This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. As you can see, our guest is someone who I'm sure is familiar to many of you, Dr. Edward Stringham. He is a professor at Trinity College in Connecticut. Uh, he is also uh, the new president of the American Institute for Economic Research, which is at a pretty venerable organization. I think it's been around since the 30s. That's right. So congratulations on that. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be in this position. Well, that's a beautiful background there at Trinity. It looks like a like a gorgeous school. I've never visited it. But what I was hoping we could talk about today was uh, is timely. It's in the news. There was another uh, police shooting recently, and, and the officer involved in the shooting was, was acquitted. His name, the, uh, the victim's name was Philando Castile. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So I, I thought, because you were the author of this book, we've talked about it in the past, Private Governance, that we might have a discussion or a conversation about how policing and crime prevention and deterrence of crime might look like in, in a more libertarian society, not a utopian or, or perfectly libertarian society. So let me start with this kind of overarching question. You know, when you look at the incentives of people in the criminal justice system, I mean, there are cops, there are lawyers, there's prison builders, there's prosecutors and judges and defense attorneys and drug counselors, and these are all good people. This isn't a conspiracy. But a lot of them make their living off having new warm bodies kind of fed into the maw each and every day. And it doesn't seem to me like it's working. That's right. So the standard assumption is law enforcement is a public good to create uh, law and order in society. But it ignores a lot of the incentives in the system. So if you give a coercive, unionized, monopoly uh, labor force authority to do basically in many cases whatever they want with little uh, oversight, then in certain cases they're going to overstep their bounds. I'm not saying that always they will, but in many cases they will. And they're not treated the same way that uh, regular citizens are in court and in, in, in uh, the sentencing process. And so the result is we've got a very high um, kill rate against citizens by police, much higher than the uh, kill rate of the regular population. Well, how do we, how do we change the incentives, though? When, when we've got a, a, a state system of, of criminal justice, it's, it's a monopoly. Um, when, the, you know, when the police come out and announce a spate, an increase in crime in your town— Nobody says, well, you're all fired. That, no, on the contrary, the police say we need more manpower, more money, more resources. That's right. So it's not a customer driven system where the, the paying customer is looking for good service and then they receive that service. Instead, it's a politically driven system where the police have an incentive to maximize their budgets, in many cases, maximize their retirement income. So uh, there's a whole disconnect between serving the customer and actually serving the police. One of my favorite books on this topic is Norm Stamper, who is a former police chief from um, Seattle. And he said he actually got into the job to help people. And within a few weeks of starting out his uh, first beats as, as a young uh, police officer, he realized it was not about the people. They didn't care about the people. They were given arrest quotas, ticket quotas, stop quotas. And it was about maximizing the numbers for the government officials and really disregard for the well-being of the public. And that's really the main difference between markets and a coercive government um, monopoly is markets don't markets don't allow the customer customer to be mistreated where a, co a coercive government monopoly does. Well, it, it's, it's interesting to me that police departments tend to grow as crime in, increases. So, so clearly the incentives are wrong. L let's talk for a moment about, about a, a more, a, an insurance model for crime prevention, uh, especially in the area of property crimes. I, I know Hopper talks about this. Rothbard certainly talked about it. Uh, in insurance model, your insurer, the insurer and the insured have, have the same incentive. They both want to avoid uh, getting robbed or, or, or paying a claim. Uh, you know, how, how could insurance work to help us prevent crime? In other words, insurance companies would try to make the people they insure uh, less susceptible to crime. 
Well, there's many ways that the private sector works to reduce crime, but the main thing that we see in the private sector is prevention. Okay, so risk mitigation. If you look at any corporate office, at any um, office building, it's all about mitigation of problems, re reduction of problems. So you'll see uh, staff at the front desk, seeing who can come in, making sure the person has the right credentials, uh, protecting valuable information. They, they don't want to uh, let that information get stolen from them and then try and deal with it after the fact. In the private sector, it's almost always a mitigation problem. It's a risk management problem. And so to assume uh, the way we do with government that, that uh, you know, something bad happens to you, you call the cops, the cops run to the scene, they, they arrest somebody or they start collecting evidence, return the property to the, uh, to the owner. That's just actually not the way that people deal with uh, reducing problems in society. Uh, police, it's a reactive approach. It's not a proactive, preventative approach. And, you know, despite what you might see in the television shows, police don't, for the most part, recover people's property. It's, it's for the most part, gone. If it's if it's you have something stolen from you, the police are not in the business of restoring the property to the victim. It's all about going after, you know, whoever they they seem bad, whoever they think is bad. In many cases, it's easier to go after the nonviolent offenders or, or a, you know, a drug seller or somebody like that. And it's a totally different model from thinking about the customer at the center, the citizen at the center of protecting people. It's all about making the police officer having a good situation. In, in certain cases, they're able to seize assets, keep a percentage of those assets for their um, department. So the incentives are totally different in the uh, government sector compared to a private sector. There's lots of different ways. I, I do uh, think the insurance model that you uh, mentioned is very interesting. And uh, you know, I'd love to see that tried. But right now we've got plenty of private solutions that don't rely on this, you know, oh, let's go get them type of uh, mentality. Well, and there are some examples that I'd like to touch on of, of private governance and, and even private policing. Uh, one in the digital world uh, in a community like eBay and one in the physical world in a in a. Uh, a place like Disneyland. Um, to talk a little bit about eBay. My wife's a big eBayer. Uh, there is a form of social opprobrium if, if somebody uh, performs poorly as a seller or a buyer. Uh, there, there, you know, there is self-interest in, in maintaining a high rating on eBay. And also, my, according to my wife anyway, an astonishing number of transactions on eBay uh, uh, go, go through without any problem. That's, that's right. So a lot of what we think about as public goods can be thought about as private club goods. So eBay is a club. They're maximizing the well-being of the buyers and the sellers. If we don't have good service on eBay, we can trade on another venue. And so eBay has an incentive to create rules and to make order within their market. A lot of it's informal. We've got the uh, reputation mechanisms, which are common throughout history in markets. You and I know each other. We trade with each other. Uh, in addition, we can tell other people whether the other party is reliable. And that's how eBay works for the most part. You've got the star rating next to your name. In addition, they have more formal private enforcement mechanisms. So in the case when something goes wrong, you can actually call up eBay or digitally message eBay. And it turns out, I, I just uh, more recently found this out, a lot of their cases are adjudicated by an algorithm. So in a particular case with me, the seller sent the wrong item. I was uh, asking for the item to be um, returned. Seller didn't respond. And so eBay instantly put the money back in my account. And so I think they could have had a person looking up that case that said, look, the guy didn't even respond. Or they could have had an algorithm that says, OK, did the buyer contact the seller? Yes. Did the seller contact the, the, the uh, buyer? No. Well, in that case, the buyer, the seller is not acting in good faith. And so you can have those mechanisms built into the system. That is a completely private uh, system of adjudication. You've got 
uh, the ability to have more people involved if it's if it's necessary. Uh, but we have all types of markets like this in the world today, private arbitration systems built into an existing market. You don't want to do business in a market which is unreliable. And so you got a club such as eBay supplying what otherwise could be considered uh, public goods. Now, I will, I'll be happy to uh, talk about that in real space as well, if, if I may. Or did you want to jump in, Jeff? No, you don't want me to talk no. for 20 hours. No, I think Disneyland's a great example. They have a, a, a private security force. Now, granted, the, our friends on the left are not going to like the idea of a private community, and eBay has a pretty steep entrance fee. Um, but once we, I'm sorry, Disneyland has a pretty steep entrance fee. But once you're inside, the, the folks at Disney have a strong incentive to not have scenes, to not have fights, drunkenness. If someone shoplifts, they 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 have cameras, but they remove them in a very pleasant and unobtrusive way. They don't want to pull out batons and beat the hell out of some guy and cause a scene. It's not in their interest. Exactly. So just like a club like eBay is maximizing the well-being of the uh, buyers and the sellers, a club like Disney is maximizing the well-being of people in that park. So you go there to have a good time. You don't want to be uh, 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 beat up. There's a, uh, a story I heard on the radio as a kid. It's probably a fake one, but this guy was uh, uh, on the radio, said he was sneaking in drugs uh, to Disney and, and smoking drugs. And um, some uh, security guards dressed as, as mice came up to him and he says, Mickey Mouse doesn't do drugs, neither should you. Um, so they did it in a way to kind of make the, uh, the a park an atmosphere which is friendly towards co customers and do it in a very friendly way. So there, you don't see police brutality at Disney. You don't see shootings at Disney. You know why? Because of consumer demand. They care about the customer, unlike government officials who are not paid by how well they treat the customer. Market providers of security do get paid by that. And you see that in lots of areas. In shopping malls, uh, that's open to the public. There's not an entrance fee, but they'll provide security, make sure that it's an orderly uh, place. And it's often almost always the case that uh, those places are, are, are safer than government streets where the police just don't care. They sit in their patrol vehicles. It's much more of a, you know, distance policing uh, uh, system. Whereas this is actually like, you know, foot patrols. You don't need an armed guard or a tank from the, from, from the government to be patrolling the streets at all times. And there's just a lot of great alternatives like that, that we do see in these private communities. Well, I know you've you've studied the concept of private governance throughout history. You, you write about some examples in your book. Here, here's what's so daunting for the U.S. system in particular is that, you know, we talk about, about deterrence. We talk about rehabilitation. We even talk about retribution in the form of the death penalty or something like this. But we never talk about restitution. In the state of California... Uh, in the state prison system, they spend something like sixty to seventy thousand dollars per year housing inmates. But if if one individual murders another, and then taxpayers pay seventy thousand dollars to put the the killer in prison all year, that doesn't do anything for the family uh, of the of the person who was murdered. So why don't we approach it more as we do in the civil arena, where we, even though it's not perfect, we try to apply monetary compensation to crimes. Yeah, the uh, criminal justice system, there's a huge over-incarceration problem. I just uh, reviewed a book for the Wall Street Journal called Locked Up, and it shows how uh, incarceration rates have been skyrocketing in uh, the United States in the past few decades. It's a huge problem. Most of the people are, are not, the, not the murderer that you're talking about, but just simple, uh, you know, petty, petty criminals. And the idea that we just add, put them in jail for 40 years, that's going to act as a deterrence. That's, um, you know, a, a very kind of controversial uh, statement, which which people make, make as an assumption, which a, a law and economic scholars actually debate and say, uh, adding a, 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 the 31st year on a 30 year sentence for some small crime is not going to act as deterrence. Now, instead of punishing people, which really doesn't uh, you know, it costs taxpayers money, doesn't help the victim. There's an alternative, which is restitution. So 
I lived in California and my uh, car got stolen. I actually got it back. It was in perfect shape by just by chance. And um, uh, and then later the police were like contacting me, like 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 trying to get the guy thrown in jail. And in my own case, I would have just rather had one hundred dollars that I had to pay for the, the rental car while my car was gone. So uh, the idea that I'm now going to have to finance, uh, you know, uh, money to put this guy in jail just doesn't make sense to me. So I think a system, and this is the way it used to work a thousand years ago in uh, England, it was, it was restitution based. So what did somebody lose? How can we try and uh, help that person, maybe make them whole in, in, in an ideal sense? That's not always possible, but it was a victim centered uh, system where uh, we cared about the person who was harmed, not like, ah, oh, we're going to slap the wrist of the uh, perpetrator. That's not clear that that's benefiting anybody. Well, let me ask you a loaded question, sort of a Walter Block question. Uh, do you think in a private system, uh, in, a, in a more libertarian legal system, could there ever be a, a, a case for a, a private death penalty? In other words, we talk a lot about proportionality, but in the instance when someone was seemed irredeemable, when they were a, a, a mass murderer, a serial killer, some, uh, uh, someone who's been violent perhaps their entire lives, it, I, I know it's sort of an academic question, but you know, it would, I don't believe in the death penalty as administered by states, uh, but could it ever, I, could it ever I, be justified? I'm strongly, I'm strongly of that position. Um, I think there's a lot more humane ways to deal with people than uh, killing people. And so uh, generally, I think that that's my normative ideal of, uh, of uh, that's what we should be looking for. And the good part about markets is it approximates pacifism. I'm not saying pacifism uh, necessarily should always be the right thing under all circumstances. So I'm not, I'm not answering your question, Jeff. I apologize. <laughs> I'll dodge the difficult question no, I, and leave I, that for, uh, I think for a I discussion agree. between you and Walter. But I do think uh, just as a practical and moral matter, markets do approximate pacifism, and, and that's good, and we should be holding up, that up as an ideal. Right. And again, the goal here is better, not perfect. Libertarians shouldn't fall into this trap, but we have to have a utopian answer for, for every human problem. Uh, let, yeah. let, let, me, let me finish with, with another tough question. Um, and it goes to this idea that Bob Murphy's talking about, about warlords and, and corporations becoming uh, a government. So there, there was supposedly a famous conversation between Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon and Murray Rothbard, where uh, Rand and Brandon were quizzing him and saying, how would police services work in your anarchist society? And Rothbard answers, private competing defense agencies. And they're both aghast and they say, you mean civil war? <laughs> so, so devil's advocate, how, how might we deal with uh, different private systems sort of rubbing up against each other as they do now at borders with state systems? Yeah, I mean, that's an important point, the last one, that we don't have uh, one uh, monopoly in the entire world. Uh, you and I are able to go to di different jurisdictions within the United States. Uh, we're outside of our local police jurisdiction. Or we're able to go to different jurisdictions around the world, which have completely different legal systems in certain cases. And for the most part, things go well. So the idea that you only can deal with one legal system, that's just uh, factually not the case. When you're doing business, especially on the um, Internet these days, you're in many cases doing pe business with people all over the world. In many cases, uh, you don't even know who these people are. And we don't need everybody to be operating under one uh, law enforcement system. Now, in a shopping mall, I could imagine uh, it looking exactly as it is right now. You have one private security force at the uh, Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, and we don't need to have a million competing, warring, uh, competing security forces within the Wynn Hotel. So I can totally imagine um, different proprietary communities having uh, their own, you know, uh, security forces. Another kind of hybrid system in San Francisco is kind of fascinating. They have a system of private policing called the Patrol Special Police. And there you have government police, but you're also allowed to hire these private police. And they have, it's not a pure free market, but they have designated beats. And so if you're in a particular neighborhood, you find out 
what private uh, police agency has uh, that beat. And so you can rely on government courts. You can rely on this patrol special service uh, police, or you can um, hire a, a stationary unarmed um, a security guard. So there, there's three types of people that you can hire, and it works quite well. In North Carolina, statewide, you can hire uh, private police, and they have jurisdiction on the property of uh, the owner. So I think we really kind of need to be getting out of the box of like, okay, the world is this big circle, and all of the people in it must follow the same uh, security agency. That's just not the way it works right now. And so for people to hold up that standard and say to uh, libertarians, say, well, I, well, you know, how can you solve this problem, which which is already being solved in the world today or or, or they can't solve in their system either? I think it's just a, a very kind of an abstract uh, question, which we can really answer with a lot of practical examples. Well, I hope these recent police shootings don't uh, lead to a greater federalization of what ought to be uh, local police services. But ladies and gentlemen, I uh, recommend Ed's book to you. It's called Private Governance, Creating Order in Economic and Social Life. Absolutely fascinating book. Pretty quick read of just a few hundred pages. Also a beautiful book published by, by Oxford University Press. And Ed, we congratulate you on your new position. We thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.